I often wonder what scriptures Jesus read and meditated upon that inspired him to um, teach the way he did. We know that Jesus wasn't any more omniscient than he was omnipresent when he was walking this earth. We also know that when he grew up as a child, he learned the scriptures at his mother's knee. When he was 12 and visiting the temple, he was asking questions about what he was observing. I'm sure it wasn't to lecture the people who were there, but to satisfy his curiosity. Now, I'm sure it wasn't his insatiable curiosity that um, the deeper things of God's word were revealed to him. How did he acquire his understanding? I think by doing the very thing that this psalm, which is the basis of our sermon, suggests, where it says, Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Jesus himself said in John 8, 28, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as the Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Jesus was obediently dependent on his Father as he revealed his will to Jesus, not only through the scriptures, but it's got to be through the book of nature, because what were his parables all about? He, I don't think he just invented it the night before, but he'd been thinking on what he had been observing in the, in the book of nature. On the first Psalm of David, he gives us a significant warning through a strange progression where one who is enticed to walk in the counsel of the wicked, he not only stops moving and stands in the way of sinners, but ends up in the seat of the scoffers. What a terrible destination. The enemy has a plan for us, and it is not good. God's plan is so much more satisfying and so much more rewarding. As we read the first psalm and compare it to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, I was surprised, and I hope you are, or maybe you already were aware of it, of all the similarities there are between these two sections of Scripture. And so here's Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. I'm sure you believe, like I do, that Jesus followed the admonition of this psalm. Did he not delight in the law of the Lord and meditate on it day and night? Does this not explain how he prospered in his spiritual journey and was so immovable in every situation when facing off with a tempter and so successful in his ministry? So what were the similarities between Psalm 1 and the Sermon on the Mount? Well, obviously, the first word jumps out at us, blessed. It's the same Greek word in the Greek Septuagint, uh, in Psalm, as it is in uh, Matthew chapter 5, where we find nine uh, times Jesus uses the word blessed in the Beatitudes. In Psalm chapter 1, verse 6, the psalmist concentrates on the two ways, the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. And he uses two metaphors that underscore this contrast. The one who delights in God's law is compared uh, in the first metaphor to a tree that draws moisture up by the stream of water by which it is planted. 
The result is fruit bearing. Its success is reflected also by its leaves that do not wither. We might be tempted to think as we reflect on our own spiritual journey that we are not very successful like the psalm promises. So we, so often we may feel we fall so short of what we should be, but the psalmist declares that the righteous prospers in all he does. The wicked are not so, David says. His second metaphor is for the wicked. They are compared to chaff, that useless part of the grain that is blown away by the wind. On the other hand, the wicked, they seem to prosper. They have big bank accounts, they have important jobs, they succeed at what they do, it seems. But it says, in the end, the way of the wicked perishes. So things are not as they appear on our earthly journey. The wicked think they are successful, and the righteous think they are fruitless. But neither perception is accurate. The righteous prosper in all that they do, and the wicked are like chaff that perish and will be blown away by the wind. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Jesus closes by focusing on the same choice between two paths, the path of the righteous, the path of the wicked. But in this um, imagery, Jesus has the narrow way and the broad way. So Jesus just uses different words for the same idea. And he concludes his sermon by suggesting his listeners make the right choice. And it's interesting to me that some of those in his audience thought themselves on the narrow way. After all, they were denying themselves this, not doing that. They had rules and regulations. They abstained from certain things. But Jesus said... In Matthew 5.20, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, they were boasting. They wanted, to, um, they wanted to impress others with their fasting, with their praying, with their giving. But uh, Jesus identified what motivated them. Well, unfortunately, instead of the narrow way, they were on the broad way because they had not taken the steps that Jesus outlined in the first of his sermon, which, is, which are the Beatitudes. Being on the narrow way is not determined by a rigorous set of rules and regulations. Being on the narrow way is equal to loving our neighbor as ourselves. And this is what sums up the Law and the Prophets. And the beautiful thing about being on the narrow way is that we're practicing the golden rule. This morning I would like to share two stories about two individuals' lives that are described by the psalmist as delighting in the law of the Lord. The first is titled Sarah's Vase, as told by Dr. David Sikera, the husband of Sarah's Sunday school teacher. Sarah's parents were new to town, and she was just getting to know her classmates at church. As a second grader, she was full of energy and beaming with naughtiness. As Sarah's Sunday school teacher, my wife provided me a limitless supply of funny stories. Monday night was usually accompanied with Sarah's latest antics. Everyone in church seemed to like her. She was simply an easy kid to fall in love with. One Sunday, my wife had prepared a lesson on being useful. She taught the children that everyone can be useful, that usefulness is serving God, and doing so is worthy of honor. The kids quietly soaked up my wife's words, and as the lesson ended, there was a short moment of silence. There and Sarah spoke up, teacher, what can I do? I don't know how to do many thing, many useful things. Not anticipating this kind of response, my wife quickly looked around and spotted an empty flower vase on the wind, windowsill. Sarah, 
you can bring a flower and put it in the vase. That would be a useful thing. Sarah frowned. But that's not important. It is, replied my wife, if you are helping someone. Sure enough, the next Sunday, Sarah brought a dandelion and placed it in the vase. In fact, she continued to do this each week. Without reminders or help, she made sure that the vase was filled with a bright yellow flower Sunday after Sunday. When my wife told our pastor about Sarah's faithfulness, he placed the vase upstairs in the main sanctuary next to the pulpit. That Sunday, he gave a sermon on the honor of serving others using Sarah's vase as an example. The congregation was touched by the message and the week started in a good note. As a pediatric physician, I've developed an uncomfortable feeling about telephone calls. During that same week, I got a call from Sarah's mother. She worried that Sarah seemed to have less energy than usual and she didn't have an appetite. Offering her some reassurance, reassurances, I made room in my schedule to see Sarah the following day. After a battery of tests and days of examination, I sat numbly in my office. Sarah's paperwork was in my lap. The results were tragic. On my way home, I stopped to see Sarah's parents so that I could personally give them the sad news. Sarah's genetics and the leukemia that was attacking her small body were a horrible mix. Sitting at the kitchen table, I did my best to explain to Sarah's parents that nothing could be done to save her life. I don't think I have ever had a more difficult conversation than the one that night. Sarah's mom looked me in the eye and with tears asked, how can this happen? Why would God allow this? As doctors, we try everything to save a life. Sometimes we find ourselves wishing to trade our life for the one of our patients, especially when they are as dear as Sarah. But sometimes nothing can be done. And a tragic end is, the only, is only a matter of time. Sarah was to have such an ending, such a beautiful life, ended by such pain and anguish, it became difficult not to question the goodness of God in Sarah's life. Time passed on. Sarah became confined to bed and to the visits that many people gave her. She lost her smile. She lost most of her weight. And then it came, another phone call. Sarah's mother asked me to come and see her. I dropped everything and ran to the house. There she was, a small bundle that barely moved. After a short examination, I knew that Sarah would soon be leaving this world. I urged her parents to spend as much time as possible with her. That was a Friday afternoon. On Sunday morning, church started as usual. The singing, the sermon, it all seemed meaningless. When I thought of Sarah, I felt enveloped in sadness. At the end of the sermon, the pastor suddenly stopped speaking, his eyes wide. He stared at the back of the church with utter amazement. Everyone turned to see what he was looking at. It was Sarah. Her parents had brought her for <clears throat> one more, one last visit. She was bundled in a blanket a dandelion in one hand. She didn't sit in the back row. Instead, she slowly walked to the front of the church where her vase still perched by the pulpit. She put her flower in the vase and a piece of paper beside it. Then she t returned to her parents. Seeing little Sarah place the flower in the vase for the last time moved everyone. At the end of the service, People gathered around Sarah and her parents, trying to offer as much love and support as possible. I could hardly bear to watch. Four days later, Sarah passed away. I canceled my morning appointments and sat at my desk, thinking about her and her parents hurting. I remembered the funny stories that my wife told about Sarah. I remembered the sw sweet sound of her laughter. I remembered 
that telephone call that brought the sadness. Tears filled my eyes as once again I struggled not to question the goodness of God in allowing Sarah's life to end in such a horrible way. I wasn't expecting it, but our pastor asked to see me after the funeral. He stood at the cemetery near our cars as people walked past us. In a low voice, he said, Dave, I've got something you ought to see. He pulled out of his pocket a piece of paper that Sarah had left by the vase. Holding it out to me, he said, you'd better keep this. It may help you in your line of work. I opened the paper and read in pink crayon what Sarah had written. Dear God, this vase has been the biggest honor of my life, signed Sarah. Sarah's note in her vase helped me to understand. I now realize in a new way that life is an opportunity to serve God by serving people. And as Sarah put it, that is the biggest honor of all. I wanted to share with you another story. This one happened as a result of the first church I pastored. 1974, I'd finished my internship at Oxnard and uh, was transferred to Santa Paula, California. And there I met Beulah. This is about her. She was no longer a nine-year-old nor a young woman that had become gray and feeble, plagued with rheumatic rheumatoid arthritis with gnarled hands, gnarled fingers, gnarled knuckles. She could have been totally discouraged by this experience. And it seemed to be impossible that she did what she did, which was to draw pictures and print very clearly. Her husband, her devoted husband, Dewey, of 50 years, was very committed to her and he had she was confined to a wheelchair, and he had built, personally built a ramp that would fold up, and he could insert it into his 1970s, or maybe it was 1960s, Volkswagen um, van. And he would push Beulah up into the van to take her home, and when he brought her to church, he would put the, the, the um, ramp out and push her down the ramp so she could attend church. Well, by this time, uh, Beulah was 73, and Dewey was 75. And what I wanted to share with you was what I have here on a small 3x5 card. It's on the screen, but I wanted to read this uh, with you. And all of the writing, all of the artwork was Beulah's handwork. Uh, it's amazing how she could do it. It's, it's not sloppy. It's... You would think somebody who wasn't immobilized or impaired by such a handicap uh, would be able to do this, but praise God she did. But here's the, the poem. In all I do, may this thought be, is this the will of God for me? Will this please him who set me free by giving his life on Calvary? Oh, what can I give back to him? He gives me life from day to day, the spirit of Christ to show me the way. God answers, hears and answers when I pray. Oh, never could I such love repay. So what can I give back to him? A mind too free from the world's din, this body tired of sickness and sin, a heart to cleanse and dwell within, my will, victory through Christ to win. All these I will offer him. I'll wear his yoke be mild and meek, show his love for the fallen and weak, for his lost ones patiently seek. Of God's power to save, gladly I'll speak. I will give true witness for him. To me, these two stories illustrate what the psalmist was talking about when he said that the righteous would prosper. And the righteous are those who meditated on God's law, who were like trees planted by streams of water, who prospered in all that they would do. It would be those who entered the narrow way, 
who would practice the golden rule, who would be liberated from rules and regulations as if they were going to persuade God to accept them based on their performance. Well, Jesus used all these images to describe those who treat others as they would like to be treated. Jesus identified everyone in the crowd by how they responded to his words. He wasn't indifferent to anyone condemning one group and, and, and affirming the other. He wanted everybody to walk the right path. He urged them all to enter the narrow way. The narrow way is a path of recovery that is designed to lead us to fully reflect the light of God's unconditional love. The first step is the first beatitude, where Jesus pronounces his blessing on those who recognize how deeply damaged and how helpless they are. If we recognize our need, he will lead us through the successive steps no matter how difficult they may be. After Jesus completed the Beatitudes, he used two more metaphors to describe those who are going through this process. The first metaphor was salt, which acts as a preservative in the experience of those we impact for Jesus. The second metaphor is light that penetrates our culture and clears the darkness in the hearts of those who are beneficiaries of the compassion that was imparted through those of us who are on the narrow way. These people will glorify the Father which is in heaven because they are being treated as Jesus would treat them. I would like to close by focusing on Jesus' last words in his Sermon on the Mount where we see Jesus' last set of metaphors. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him. In Psalms, the righteous were likened into a tree that's planted by rivers of water. Here, Jesus likens those who hear and do his words. I will liken him to a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, but it fell not because it was founded on the rock. So if we remain surrendered to Jesus by delighting in what we hear him say and following his instruction, he assures us that we are building on the rock and that we are succeeding in all that we do. And regardless of the circumstances that come our way, regardless of the intensity of the opposition of the enemy, the storm cannot cause us to fail because we are building on the rock, and that rock is Jesus. But Jesus' strongest warning was saved for the last of his metaphors, for those who refused to love their neighbor as themselves, for those who refused to recognize their need, and refused to implement Jesus' instruction, would in the end, no matter how successful they might appear to be, in achieving their objectives would fail. They would be blown away. Jesus said, and everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. This morning we reflected on two tender hearts, one of a young girl of only nine who struggled with leukemia and another young girl who grew old, grew gray, and struggled with rheumatoid arthritis. Both of them brought a light to their world just as Jesus did. The light of their example still shines to inspire us to see our service to him as our greatest honor, whether we may feel we are too young or too old or too crippled to make a difference. None of us is beyond making a difference in other people's lives if Jesus' words are what we delight in and what we obey. The psalmist said he would prosper in all 
We do. We may not see it, but in God's view, we are prospering because we are being transformed by his love. We are becoming more and more like Jesus. If that is the case, then there will be results in other people's lives. We may not see the results, but he's not going to light us up to make us ineffective. And so this morning, I would invite you as we close to bow your heads as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you most of all for Jesus and how he humbled himself and was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. We thank you for all of this imagery. We thank you for the devotion of Jesus to the word that he inspired that he had to learn again as a child, that he faithfully meditated upon, leaving us an example so that we might follow the path of salvation, a path that begins with recognizing our great need, our own insufficiency to remedy our weaknesses. We're grateful that you have made provision for a complete recovery and we want to continue to trust you by immersing ourselves in your word, and particularly Jesus' words that are so full of meaning. As we reflect upon them, we pray that you will continue the transformation so that at last your objective will be completed in our lives. Thank you for hearing us and for answering our prayers because we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.